What is up, everybody? Welcome to The Stack. I'm Alex. What's up? I'm Pete. And on The Stack, we talk about a ton of books that have come out. A ton. Out. A ton of books that have come out this week. We're going to kick it off with a big one. Superman, number one, from DC Comics, written by Joshua Williamson. Wait, art I... by Jamal Campbell. Wait, Hold on, what? Oh, are we going to start with something else? Let's just back up the truck a little bit. Something I've been thinking about oh. is, you know, uh, what's better? for the audience you know is it better to maybe do less spend a little bit more time to deep dive on this or mm-hmm. are you cool with kind of like a spread of like try to get as many comics as we can you know what i mean because uh it'd be interesting to see oh so you're okay so we have a ludicrous amount of comics that we're talking about Luda. this week Luda. you're wondering if people would like less comics or more comics well i'm just not like that you dickhead i'm just saying like maybe less comics and we get to talk about the ones that we are talking about more uh, because there are so many we got to be like good next one yeah it was also good okay here's my well, question just... are we going to do that <laughs> because we have it based on 15 years of experience pete all right all right talk about it here here's how this podcast works i'm just gonna lay it out oh first. oh why don't you okay. tell me yeah absolutely so what happens I, is just in terms of the time the schedule is particularly if all three of us are here the first comic we talk about for about 10 minutes and usually it's a bunch of dub bits that we're throwing out there yeah mixed in with some reviewing and then the second book that's usually like five to seven minutes and then usually by the last five you get panicky and you're like gotta go gotta wrap this up come on goodbye we're taking too long good bad good bad good bad yeah so that's on you, Pete, man. Oh, okay, great. All right. Well, I'm glad we pinpointed the problem. <laughs> I think so. Part of the problem is that we're two minutes into this podcast and we haven't talked about Superman number one yet, which I thought was great. I was very impressed by this. I didn't know necessarily what to think because Philip Kennedy Johnson and company have been killing it over on Action Comics. What is a new Superman title going to bring to the table? Is it going to feel like a Superman number one? And I'll tell you what, 100% does. We don't necessarily have a completely new status quo, but Superman's identity is back in the closet. Lois Lane is now the editor-in-chief of the Daily Planet. Lex Luthor is in prison and whispering to Superman tips the entire time and being like, hey, here's how you got to take down Livewire. Here's how you got to take down Parasite. So fascinating new dynamic that I don't think I've ever seen from Lex Luthor and Superman. There's a great twist at the end that explains what Lex Luthor is up to that, again, I don't think I've ever seen before. I had a blast reading this comic book. Pete, what about you? Okay, well, a couple things I want to talk about. First, it's weird that this is the number one because it's not starting at a new beginning. It's very much kind of uh, picking up on all the things that have been going on, like you said. So I was a little kind of like, why is this number one? Also, there's a shit ton of covers because I get it. It's Superman number one. So we're DC's going to put like a lot of variants in there. But God damn, that's a lot of covers. Uh, other than that, um, um, I I thought it was cool. I uh, kind of had like a classic Superman story, fun, kind of clean art style, um, which I feel like is a good choice for soups. But why the fuck out of all the voices in the world would you give a fact what Lex Luthor is fucking chirping about? Fuck you, Lex Luthor. You know what I mean? Like, that should be the last person you should be listening to at all times. It's just weird that uh, Lex Luthor occupies so much of Superman's kind of life that, like, it's not hard enough. He's got to fight a battle. He's also got to, like hear Lex in his head going, you should just joke about, you should just kill him, you should stop wasting your time. You know what I mean? And he's got to be like, shut up, Lex. You know, I'm doing stuff. I'm busy. You know I I, mean? I like, love that. I mean, a couple of quick things just to throw out there. First of all, I'm not sure if you're aware, but you might I mean, I wasn't done with my bit. I was oh, going to okay. say, what oh, if he, okay. you know, goes to uh ice cream store and, you know, Lex is like, you should get low fat. You know, and it's like, fuck you, Lex. You know what I mean? I burn a lot of calories. You shouldn't be telling me how to live my life. You know what I mean? Where does the, you know what I mean? Is he spending alone time with Lois? And he's like, yeah. Like, where does, where's the line? Sounds like, like maybe somebody on this podcast has their own personal Lex Luthor in the form of a Jiminy Cricket 
style conscience who might be whispering to him when he goes into the ice cream store. But Jamal Campbell is the artist off of Far Sector, which you love. Not sure if you're aware of that. Also, in terms of the number one thing, I do want to throw out there that I think, like I laid out and like we're talking about here, it's not a new status quo because it's super bad. It's an ongoing book. But at the same time, Josh Williamson really does put a lot of origin resetting things in here. He does, and this is not a slight at all, he does this attempt at trying to do the all-star Superman first page thing, which is untouchable. It, it is, is. It's untouchable. It's but at dope. the same time, like there's a beautiful layout by Jamal Campbell of Superman's origin and history in his cape as he's saving somebody, which I thought was very cool and a fun riff on that. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I The thing about the Lex Luthor, I know, is just joking about this, but, like, that idea of that voice in the back of your brain, it was like, why don't you do this instead? Why don't you do that? I thought it was a really interesting emotional hook for the issue, and it does make a lot of sense, as Superman explains here, why he would be focusing on Lex Luthor, that there's a couple of people that he hears no matter what, and Lex is one of those, because that's his arch enemy. That's the person he needs to focus uh, on. I can understand, like, your arch enemy gets in your head, but it's a live chat. You know what I mean? It's not mm-hmm. his voice. It's him actually in the cell, you know what I mean? It's a live chat, which I was like, what? Like, I can understand, like, you fight somebody so much or you're somebody is so much a part of kind of who you are and what you're against. You know, they're the opposite of you. So maybe their voice is in your head. That makes sense to me. But the live chat thing was a little bit like, what? You know Imagine I mean? like, okay, I'm just going to put out a scenario there. Let's say you're on a comic book podcast and you have two people who have very differing opinions about things. Mm-hmm. Maybe when you're reading a comic, you hear that person's voice in your head, kind of oh, like God, whispering things to you a little bit about like, oh, why don't you think this about that? Oh, why don't you think about that? You know, what's nice though, is if a third host is maybe in a cabin that doesn't have Wi-Fi, you don't hear their voice at all. So that's kind of like <laughs> oh, man. Some freedom there. You know? Well, listen, I'd love to stretch this out for another three minutes so we can get to a requisite 10 minutes on the opening comment. Yeah, it looks but like don't... you weren't correct at all on your stupid fucking Mrs. Marvel's podcast. <laughs> Jeez, potty mouth over here. Betsy Braddock, Captain Britain, number one from Marvel, written by T.D. Howard, art by Vasco Georgiev. This is I would say a stealth Excalibur series as we get Bessie Braddock, who is the new Captain Britain. She is dating Rachel Summers. So you get that a little bit of Excalibur there. She's teaming up with a bunch of other characters from the Excalibur years. And there's some weird stuff going on in other world. Uh, what did you think about this? I thought this was great. Our uh, cool, fun uh, kind of last page uh, I, I thought like this was a cool uh, a Great Britain issue. There was a lot of uh, Britons there, so that was very creative, enjoyable, and also a dinosaur. So like, uh, there's a dinosaur fun. Captain Britain. You can't be yeah. mad about that. Yeah, right? exactly. This is fun, and also just kind of like having some fun with the character. I felt that kind of fun jumped off the page and made it enjoyable. Uh, the art style was uh, uh, kind of leaned into that. I thought I thought it was a good match. Uh, for the story. I thought it worked well. This, my only little clip with this is like I was hinting at earlier, it feels a little more like a stealth team book rather than focusing on Betsy Braddock specifically. But I like all of these characters. I like Rachel Summers. Pete Wisdom shows up here, which is yeah. a fun character. There's a couple of ca- other characters that have popped up throughout Excalibur history. So fun stuff, I think. It was Blue- a weird moment when the character was like, Pete, and I just kind of looked over my shoulder like, oh. Huh? Oh my God, is he, she know? Oh, it was like they were whispering in your ear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So just so, just so I hear you correctly, your problem was just the titling setting wrong expectations uh, for you. Yes, yeah, so if you're doing a Betsy Braddock solo book, I want to see a little more focus on her personally versus... So if it would have been like Betsy Braddock and team setting a better expectation for you, you wouldn't have... Okay. I'm not sure what you're getting at, but yes. <laughs> I'm just saying you're a very specific kind of nerd that uh, rubs me the wrong way. Oh, okay. <laughs> Blue Book, number one for Dark Horse Comics, written by James Todd the Fourth, art by Michael Avon Oming. This is a book including two stories. The main story that we're going to follow throughout is about a couple that, spoiler, that you can figure out by the cover of the issue, I think, encounter some aliens back in the day as they're driving through a backcountry road. And and then there's a backup story as well telling weird tales. And I think we're going to get more of that here. We get a weird story of 
Coney Island in, I don't know, I want to say the 1920s or 30s or something like that. I thought this was a very cool book. And two very different modes of art from Michael Avon Oming that I was very impressed by. In particular, what did you think, Pete? Yeah, really impressive, the shift in the art style uh, in one book that they all worked. This was cool. I like this idea of kind of UFO stories. Uh, Blue Book is the kind of uh, uh, title for it. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, UFOs, hot topic right now. Uh, you know, government says they're real. Uh, so yeah, I think there's going to be a big kind of push in comic books for UFO stories. I think we're going to see a wave of uh, UFO stories coming to comics. Well, that's pretty exciting. I mean, given the schedule of comics, we'll be talking about them in, I don't know, three, five years, something like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, should be pretty cool. But if you are looking for one that embraces the trend right now, as Pete's talking about, definitely check out Blue Book number one. Local Man, number one from Image Comics, written by Tim Seeley, art by Tony Fleeks and Tim Seeley. So the idea here is what if a Image Comics 90s style hero really messed up, got completely kicked off of his uh, Cyber Force Gen 13 style team, and then had to go live at home again? What would happen? And... It's great. It's exactly the sort of humor you want from Tim Seeley. Tony Fleeks, who we know from Stray Dogs, does a great job here as well on the art. And the backup story where it's Tim Seeley doing just a straight up fake 90s story is pitch perfect parody. I had a very fun time reading this book. Yeah, I think that's a great way to describe it. It's a fun book. It's also, you know, kind of this classic uh you know story about a hero who doesn't get, always get things right or makes a mistake we kind of pick up where you know he humbly has to go back home where you know maybe he used to be a big deal but now everybody hates him <laughs> and we're not sure quite uh why he messed up or everything we're kind of getting that story as we go but just a fun place to start you know and i think um uh you know I also felt very seen uh, when it when it came to the parents, you know, as far as like my dad has this thing about like eating at certain times and he has does not care about any other outside circumstances. So the dad kind of being like, it's 830. Nobody has dinner at this time was just very funny to me. Um, but yeah, I think this is a very great start for a first ish, you know, kind of like really sucks you into this world and you kind of can pick up on what's going on. Um, yeah, cool premise, well executed. You got a bunch of pros working on it. So this this seems like it's going to be a fun, fun story and cool comic. Yeah, there's just a really good emotional hook here because who cannot relate to coming home and feeling awkward about coming home? This is taken to the umpteenth degree. So very yeah. fun. Next up, New Mutants Lethal Legion, number one from Marvel, written by Charlie Jane Anders, art by Enid Balam. Here, we're getting a spinoff of the New Mutants series, following a bunch of the characters as they face off against the vampiric Lethal Legion of the title. Uh, how'd you feel about this, Pete? Well, I felt like this was um, uh, kind of a cute and kind of adorable take on New Mutants. A lot of sitting around talking. Uh, fun villain, great last page kind of reveal. Uh, great fucking art. Uh, has kind of like a hip style to it that I dug. Yeah. Uh, I like the art in particular. I do think this book was a little busy for me, to be frank. Like you're talking about the sitting around and be talking. Alex. You know what I mean? Don't be anybody else. What? You should just be Alex. Don't be Frank. Oh, wow. Oh, my gosh. You lost all standing for the rest of the podcast, Pete. Oh, okay. That's fair. This, Sorry, I've been, uh, this book is a little busy. With a lot of kids, of... so the yes. dad jokes are going to okay. take a little bit to wear off. Uh, fair, enough. I was... fair enough. I understand. Yeah. This, like I was saying, I think there's a lot of stuff going on in this book, and I do like some of the character moments in particular, but there's a lot of it. And not that I'm against having a ton to digest, but this was a lot to digest in one issue. Um, but, you know. Uh, there's things that pop, and if you like the characters, I think you might enjoy it. Let's turn it over to Lazarus Planet Omega, number one from DC Comics, written by Mark Wade, Gene Luen Yang, art by Ricardo Federici and Mike Perkins and Billy Tan. Now, we have followed every issue of this from the Lazarus Planet Alpha through all of the one-shot issues that had 
seemingly totally unrelated tales. And now finally, the saga of Lazarus Planet is wrapping up. I'll just say this up front. If you want to understand what's going on in Lazarus Planet, the, the Alpha issue and the Omega issue, you don't have to read anything in the middle to understand the story. However, it's a good story. Uh, it, it's fun. The art by Ricardo Federici and Mike Perkins is probably oh, yeah. great. Mark Wade knows to write, way to write around a story. Um, I like all the characters involved here. I don't know what it amounted to at the end of the day, but I don't know. I had a good time reading it, so who cares? Oh, okay. Well, great. Uh, I have some crazy cool covers. Um, uh, first story had super tight bananas art style, just very cool. Love the use of colors. Second story had this kind of like cool anime style to it. Monkey Prince and Dark Side, very cool as well. Uh, yeah, I've been loving the uh, Lazarus Pl Planet stuff, this kind of collection of uh, short stories, if you will. Uh, I thought it was a neat kind of umbrella to try to get a bunch of ideas and kind of different perspectives. So, yeah, I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah, I I think that's a good way of putting it in terms of talking about it as an umbrella. It definitely feels like the sort of thing that's like, editorially, we need to move these characters from this place to this place. But everybody put their heart and soul into it, and they ended up with a lot of fun stories. So that's why I said it in terms of, like, who cares is... You know, there's certainly things that are like, oh, it feels like I'm reading a chess match. You're moving pieces around the board. Mm -hmm. And that's what this was. But the fact that everybody made it worth it makes it fun. And like you talked about the monkey print stuff from Gene Lu and Yang and Billy Tan is always great. So good yeah. stuff. Exo Manowar Unconquered, number one from Malliant, written by Becky Clune and Michael W. Conrad, art by Liam Sharp. This is a very advanced review. I believe this comes out March 22nd, if I remember correctly. Well, I mean, why... You know, why do it now? You know what I mean? Like, we could have saved this for maybe a stack that wasn't so jam-packed. You know what I mean? I don't know, man. It's pretty cool to have an advanced review this advanced, right? And we do really like the team of Beck included Michael W. Conrad, where we yes, talk we about do. their Wonder Woman, I believe, later on in the stack. Also, Liam Sharp rules on art. Like, if you're looking for... I feel like Liam Sharp has this classic 90s or 2000s prestige graphic novel style art you know what i'm talking about like that's what it comes through it uh, to me as um which that's what this is this is exo matter war stranded on an alien planet fighting a bunch of armored dudes just exactly the thing you want out of exo matter war and it's brutal throughout yeah i mean i loved the action love the art i thought uh just some amazing panels artistically and uh, just such a great package as far as like artist and writer and what you're getting in this issue. I, th I thought this fucking, uh, this issue slapped. It was really just absolutely fantastic. Worth picking up for sure. Yeah. Uh, Tower number one from A Wave Blue World written by Cameron Johnson and Kelsey Barnhart art by Criss Cross. Cameron Johnson, of course, was... I wanted to say Nightwing, but that's not who he was. Batwing on the Batwoman show. Yeah. Um, and uh, he got he got the comics bug writing some books about his character. And now he's writing this. This is your classic people wake up in a video game, except it's a oh, deadly video game story. I was a little iffy about this at the beginning, to be honest, because I feel like I've read this a bunch before. But I thought the iterations of how they went through the video game world were fun, and I had a good time by the end. But what about you, Pete? You ever had this nightmare where you kind of wake up in a video game that maybe you've played too long or something like that? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, that's why. Like when this happened, I was like, "Oh, God!" I don't. You know what I mean? Like a little bit of a uh, shake goes down the spine there, where you're just like, "Oh man, I've had this. I've had this nightmare." But. Uh, I think it's a universal thing where you can kind of really pick up quickly on what's going on. Um, yeah, I, I like the kind of star. Everybody gets a weapon. This how you know, like okay, we've seen this. Like they didn't spend too much time on it. They kind of got right to it. I also like the kind of like last page re kind of villain reveal thing, and then also um, you know the fact of like. Instead of immediately fighting everybody, you know, like, hey, we need to talk. You know, mm -hmm. Let's talk. 
we're all living the same nightmare like instead of just immediately fighting each other like you know let's try to get on the same page here a little bit so i'm glad that kind of won out because that can kind of drive you crazy when you're reading a comic and kind of yelling at it to like no just stop fighting each other they're talking out a little bit first no, yeah, no. it definitely leans into genre tropes, but it also does it in a smart and intelligent way where it finds interesting ways around it. So definitely worth the pickup. Amazing Spider-Man number 20 from Marvel, written by Joe Kelly, there art by go. Terry Dodson. This is Spider-Man and Black Cat are on a sexy vacation, and Mary Jane and her new boyfriend slash husband, still not totally clear, are there as well. There's also a bunch of supervillains going on. Pete, you all right? No. No? Uh, you're just not you, okay? I hope you guys are having fun. I hope whoever Marvel thinks is enjoying this shit is having a good time, and I hope you're enjoying your time in the sun, because hopefully it'll be over soon, and we can get this fucking Is this shit just about you don't like Spider-Man and Black Cat together? Yes. Oh. Let me ask you a question, because I feel like this is a universal experience. That time when Spider-Man and Black Cat had sex on a rooftop, is that when your first chest hair popped out as well? Because it was for me. Okay. Well, hey, congratulations. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah. You were Before really... that issue, I was like, wait, wait, wait. You were I reading... love comics. And after that <laughs> issue, I was like, I love comics. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. So there you go. Man, man, that's uh, that's some real. If you uh, didn't have that emotional stuff. connection, is my point, then maybe that explains why you don't like the relationship. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Sorry, physical connection. I guess. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's clearly a physical connection for you. Yes, uh, I, mean, I will say I don't. Just, I don't know, love this actually. Like this is not the same reason that you do, but I have been loving this run. I think they've been. It's Zeb Wells, I believe. The whole mystery of what went on that we're going to find out very soon with Mary Jane and Spider Man. Yeah. That's going to be an I'm issue twenty five and twenty six. to drop, but also to hear Spider Man tr- like sum up his relationship and then call her a sister was a fucking stab in the fucking chest. Like, dude, you have been with this woman for years and years of your life, and to see you kind of be like try to sweep it underneath the carpet. To maybe get a kiss. It was just like. Listen, Joe Kelly writes a fun comic book. Terry Dodson and Rachel Dodson draw a phenomenal comic book as well. Agreed with that. Good stuff if you're looking for it. But this felt a little busy for me. And the main thing is, I, I that seems to be my watchword of the episode. I wanted to get back to the main plot. I understand they need to fill in to probably catch up and get ahead. But. This, the main plot of Spider-Man right now has been so engrossing and interesting to me that I just want to get back to that. And like you're saying, I'm very curious to see what happens. There's certainly some hints. Can we talk about it real quick? Because they put out the solicits already for, I believe the solicits, or at least a tease for 25 and 26, where they're going to reveal what happened with Spider-Man when we picked up with him in issue one with this explosion, what happened with Mary Jane, and they've teased that it's the biggest event that's happened to Spider-Man in forgetting how many years, but however many years it is, it was exactly the number of years since Gwen Stacy died. So I mentioned this a couple of episodes back. I proved pretty confident in my theory that Mary Jane died. Like, we're going to find out Mary Jane died. Spider-Man made some sort of deal maybe with some sort of demonic entity, maybe not, I don't know, to bring Mary Jane back to life. That's where she got these jackpot powers we've been seeing over in Mary Jane and Black Cat. And that's also why she is removed from Peter right now. Maybe. It could be another reason, but at the very least, I'm pretty sure she when died. When you said Mary Jane back. died, a part of me just died. Um, yeah. I, yeah, I don't want to live in this world if that's what's going to happen. You know <laughs> oh my God, like, so Jesus dark. Christ, Stop. <laughs> Just stop. You created this character, this amazing character everybody loves. Stop fucking ruining it. All right? Fucking reset it and start writing new stories from there. Stop fucking with something that really works and works really well. I love it. Keep fucking with me. Keep fucking with me. (laughs) That's what I want. 
Enough cursing, enough of this potty mouth. Let's move to Batman One Bad Day, Clayface number one from DC Comics, written by Colin Kelly and Jackson Lansing, art by Zermonico. This is my issue of the week, I'm going to say. I was completely floored by this. Jackson Lansing and Colin Kelly have been doing a phenomenal job on every title they've been writing. We've been loving their Captain America run in particular. Zermonico, always phenomenal on art. But the format of this is Clayface leaves Gotham, has moved to Los Angeles, is trying to make it as an actor, and they lay it out as a script that Clayface is writing or studying or somebody else is writing, you're not 100% sure, but it's very inside baseball about Hollywood, but feels totally accessible. And Pete, you mentioned this a little bit on a live show, but the emotional component here in terms of how much you feel for Clayface, who is a horrible murdering monster the entire time, is through the roof. I was floored by this book. I loved reading it. The One Bad Day books have been great pretty much across the board, but this is top tier for me. I agree. I, I, I don't know what it is about Clayface, but the, the the first off, very amazing covers. This was such a great issue. Uh, just the fact that like you can feel for this villain and you see the struggle, you kind of know, and it's just like, the way that they can showcase the sadness within Clayface in a comic book is it's very impressive. And they did such a great job leaning into this. It's just so well showcased the art, the, the writing and the story. It's just, uh, I was just super impressed by this. It could have, I, it's just such a cool character and well, when done well, it can be very moving. So, uh, yeah, this was such an awesome issue. The uh, art is super uh, tight, shape-shifting bananas, and uh, uh, definitely a must-pick up. And one last thing I'll say about it, because we've been talking about this with most of the issues of this One Bad Day, One Shot crossover, they are very specific. This takes place in one day, and I really appreciated that. Really points out how the rest of the team's totally screwed up in terms of the timeline Don't and at least this is the one this, time to this is the only one that works the rest of them are just abjectly bad that is... what? <laughs> i'm kidding but at the same time i did think it funny that uh, later on spoiler but in the book batman is like this all happened in one day and i was like thank you <laughs> we're going to talk about this on my podcast Black Cloak, number two, from Image Comics, written by Kelly Thompson, art by Meredith McLaren. This is continuing the story of a murder mystery taking place in a far future, but still high fantasy realm. We get to meet a lot more of the denizens of this weird city as our main character explores the mystery. I know we love the first issue of this. How do you feel the second issue held up? Still banging. Like, this is such a great comic i love the anime style of this love the story and the, all the different types of characters also another like ghost bag head uh, character we get in this which is becoming an interesting trend but this is so cool and so creative uh i i, I absolutely love this comic and it continues to deliver I just to throw it out there i understand what you're saying but i feel like meredith mclaren's style is a little more of like indie ya comic in a certain way sure. yeah. uh but still like we talked about with the first issue should work against but actually works for the story in really fascinating ways and kelly thompson is always takes these very complicated ideas and makes them super accessible and fun and interesting to read just a great book overall damn them all number five from boom studios written by simon spurrier art by charlie adler this is following a, I don't want to call her a detective, but she is a magical something or other who is trying to stop this demonic mob war that is happening in her city. We get a bunch of wrinkles and twists and turns here. This is great. I feel like our main character has been on the sidelines a little bit the past mm -hmm. issue or two. There's been so much going on. She's brought back to the forefront here, and I really appreciated and enjoyed that. Yeah, I mean, this continues to be an awesome comic. Um, I, you know, we kind of got a last page kind of twist reveal, which was very enjoyable. This is this is very cool, but also kind of messed up. Um, but uh, man, 
it's there there's a lot that got kind of happens in this issue that I was glad that we got it's a it's a meaty uh issue there's a lot that goes down so I'm glad that we got this one I'm continuing to have a blast with this uh with this comic it's uh it's fantastic super creative Deadpool number four from Marvel, written by Alyssa Wong, art by Martin Coquello. In this issue, Deadpool, who has been affected with a baby carnage, ends up in a big brawl to end them all with Dr. Octopus and a character called, I believe, Harbinger, among other things. It's just a big fight scene the whole episode, uh, episode, all issues. So, Pete, you had to love that. Yeah, this is fun, enjoyable madness. I mean, super tight bananas art fun uh you know spoiler but carnage reveal at the end a lot of action i love the kind of voice of deadpool in this i feel like sometimes that doesn't get nailed very well but uh wong is doing a great job on this and uh yeah it feels like deadpool which is fantastic yeah i'm having a blast reading this one as well very fun run on deadpool so far and very unexpected in terms of the mix of characters which i always appreciate yeah Wonder Woman number 796 from DC Comics, written by Becky Cluden and Michael W. Conrad and Jordi Belair, art by Amon K. Nahulpin and Paulina Ganeshel. In this issue, Wonder Woman is fighting Eros, uh, also with Yara Flores. I think that's the name of the character. I don't know why I suddenly blanked on it, but lots of team stuff going on here. I know I mentioned this with the last issue, but beyond all the Wonder Woman stuff, I love the team dynamics. I think that's my favorite part of this book right now. Steve and Sigmund being yeah. buds fighting a giant Titan. Great. All the stuff with Cheetah and Etta Candy, where Cheetah is like hitting on her and trying to kiss her, but <laughs> Etta's like, yo, you think I'm not a catch? Just so fun. And so all of these different team dynamics are great. Wonder Woman doesn't necessarily come out of the focus, but I'm loving the side characters and I'm loving the team nature of the book, which is almost antithetical to what I said about the Betsy Braddock book. But here it's working for me. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, some amazing covers uh, for this. This is such a great ish. Uh, tons of action. Love the last page reveal. Uh, this has been such a great ride. The fun team ups, like the teams coming together. I also love the Shira style uh, kind of back off that we get. That's a, this is a total package comic where you're getting amazing back up and an amazing big story. Uh, this continues to really uh, over deliver, and it's impressive. Junkyard Joe, number five from Image Comics, written by Jeff Johns, art by Gary Frank. In this issue, Junkyard Joe and the men who wear metal faces that look like Junkyard Joe come face to face. There's a big fight. Junkyard Joe escapes with a bunch of kids in the neighborhood. Now, I want to throw something out at you, which is kind of a crazy thing to say, because I really like this title. There's a level of emotion that Jeff Johns is bringing here that... I think we haven't seen a whole lot from him recently, which I'm very happy to see. But this title, every issue feels like a different 80s movie to me. And every (laughs) time they settle on it, I'm like, this is a great idea. And then, like this issue, the idea of three kids on the run with their robot army friend while a bunch of guys chase after them. Perfect 80s. 80s, Perfect 80s action movie. Yeah. Uh, not action movie, perfect 80s, like, kids movie. And then I got to the end, and it was like, stay tuned for our next and last issue. And I was so bummed out because I was like, oh, this is such a good idea. And every issue before this as well was like, what if the robot that this guy fought in war with came back home and cleaned his house? And again, that's like, that's an 80s movie idea. So there's all these fantastic ideas right now, but it's zipping through them so quickly, which, is, mind you, is laudable. But I kind of just want to settle on one. I want one to be like, that was the six issues. So that's bumming me out a bit, is I like these ideas too much. Well, yeah, I mean, that's a nice thing to say that you want Absolutely. more. Absolutely. But I love this issue because we finally got to see Joe kick some butt. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was great to kind of see Joe in action. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. This has been a, kind of like a slow kind of reveal of what joe is and what joe's about so this has been very interesting and very well done and i want more and it's sad that it's ending but still uh, unbelievable art some really good storytelling Uh, this has been great once upon a time at the end of the world number four from boom studios written by jason aaron art by alexandra tufengi 
last issue, our main dude was captured by the evil Boy Scouts from the post-apocalypse who had uh, previously been training and working with our main female character. This issue, we get some big revelations about what's going on with her in particular, as well as how these evil Boy Scouts work. Just another banger of an issue from this team. Yes, yes, I agree. Um, yeah, I mean, this has been, we kind of got these evil scouts and one of the things I was a sucker for was their house and they kind of like cut in half mm -hmm. graph, a breakdown of all the different rooms and floors. I'm a sucker for that. Also, we got all the patches for the evil scouts. So that was really cool. But yeah, this has just been, uh, such a touching story in this post-apocalyptic messed up world, uh, but the art has been just uh, super tight bananas. And we're really hoping that these two kind of main characters can find a way back to each other because it's it's heartbreaking, you know, the fact that they're separated and, and the fact that, you know, spoilers, but like when she's told her home got burnt, I was, oh, just, uh, it was rough, man. It was rough to see in her face. Yeah, there's a lot of emotion in here. I do want to mention, you mentioned the cross-section of the Scouts base as well as the Patches page. Something that struck every issue is Jason Aaron is nailing the comedic rhythm of things, yeah. which is not an easy thing to do in comics at all, particularly not just in terms of like patter back and forth, but visually the way that Alexandra Tefenge lays it out. It's funny, and uh, yeah. there's not a lot of books that are legitimately funny. This is one of them at the same oh. time as it's very dark. Also, it just says so much about Jason Aaron's writing where like, he can do such huge epic things on Thor and, and different kinds of stories, but also this is, you know, it's a big post-apocalyptic world, but it's a small story about two people, and it's, it's really impressive, not only the comedic timing of stuff, but also the emotion that's all balanced in there it's uh, the range just jason aaron guy you know he, everything from punisher to this i mean it gets me in the emotions i tell you what man there you go planet hulk world breaker number four from marvel written by greg pock yeah. art by manuel garcia in this issue the hulks are coming to try to save sakar once again and doing a pretty bad job of it pete i know this title has very much been your jam how do you feel it's working for issues in yeah, I'm having a great time. We need to have Pocky back on the show to talk to him about this comic. Um, yeah, I love uh, uh, this issue. There's a lot of, like, build-up, uh, great last page reveal. This is getting very exciting, and uh, we're getting more and more information as the story is kind of building up, and it's been filling in a lot of these uh, spaces um, that we didn't know about. So uh, I'm having a blast with this and I'm looking forward to a lot of Hulk action. There you go. Nightwing 101 from DC Comics, written by Tom Taylor and C.S. Picot, art by Travis Moore and Eduardo Pensica. Of course, this is an intro level Nightwing book, uh, which you can take before you move on to the 201 and the uh, 301. You, you took my joke, you <laughs> Uh, I was going to be like, I, hey, I'm here for Nightwing 101. Oh, there you go. Nice. We thought of the same thing. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> in this issue, we're picking up on a lot of the plot lines that we kind of left behind for a little bit as we were jamming into the Heartbreaker stuff here. We catch up with the lady who, uh, Necron, Neron, I never remember his name, but the guy from Underworld Unleashed is after. Uh, and we get some twists here, as well as the introduction of a new terrifying character called the Smiling Man. Oh. How'd you feel about this one, Pete? I'm really, how it ended, I was very worried. Mm -hmm. uh, but man, just, uh, this has been, Nightwing is like right now and for the last bunch of issues has been a must pull it has just been uh, such a banger like every time it's a solid from the art to the writing it's just so amazing such a great package you've got to check this out this is just such an amazing ish uh i can't say enough uh, great things about this um and oh man all the stuff that goes down in this i cannot i'm dying to see what happens next because where they live and i'm like oh god no, not the girl. So, oh, no, no. 
you know. Uh, it's great. What more can you say about this book at this point other than it's good every single time out of the gate? Yes. Radiant Pink, number three from Image Comics, written by Megan uh, Camarena and Melissa Flores, art by Emma Kubert. Radiant Pink and what turns out is her nemesis are stranded in an alternate reality together with an enormous cat. I like the first issue of this. I was a little iffy. Oh, is this number four? Or is that what you're saying? Pete? No, no, the cat with the four eyes. Man. Oh, four cat eyes. with four eyes. Okay, there we go. Uh, I was iffy about the second issue. I felt like it was a little messier, but this issue brought it back into focus. There's some great romance in here. There's some uh, good jokes. We get a little bit of a crossover with Inferno Girl Red as well, yeah. which I thought was very neat. So I had a fun time. I'm definitely back on board. And Emma Kubert's art is just, great oh it's just God. perfect for this book you get it's got like a little power rangers feel to it i love the use of color in this it's so great yeah i i agree that this issue is just fantastic really got things kind of really going uh uh yeah i've just been well, all these radium books have been absolutely fantastic and they continue to do such a great job of world building this issue is just absolutely uh, glorious to look at and to read. Uh, this is great. Specs number four from Boom Studios, written by David M. Boer, art by Chris Sheehan. This is the final issue of this title about some magic glasses that kind of grant you wishes, but not really. And here we're wrapping up the story of these two boys who got the glasses. One of them is uh, in love with the other one, and we get a big confession in this issue that I thought was really emotionally well done. I'm yeah. still a little iffy on how the specs work and how this turned out at the end here, but at the same time, I really like the art in this book, and I thought the characterization was good. So even with some sort of wonky, are we doing an Outer Limits thing, are we doing a Twilight Zone, not 100% sure, I was still on board for all four issues. Yeah, I... um it it did it did kind of feel like it didn't get its footing sometimes like it, i was ha having a hard time of just kind of like labeling this comic of what it is and what it's about but man this la uh this issue was just emotional the whole like coming out thing was really very moving and well done i loved it um yeah, and the specs thing, it's sometimes seemed like crazy powerful, and other times not at all. Um, and then you just, you know, if something freaks you out, just throw it in a river. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, maybe it'll transform into cooler specs and kind of looks like the Cyclops specs at the end there, uh, which lets you know a lot about Cyclops. You know what I mean? Like Absolutely. Just, that took me on quite a journey, what you just said, but I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Doctor Strange Fall Sunrise number four for Marvel by Trad Moore. This is continuing this wild story of Doctor Strange that I don't know what's going on, but I love looking at it. I mean, this is worth it for the art alone. You need to pick up this comic because this is crazy, tripped out type bananas art. This is just gorgeous. I want to live in this comic book. It's so fun. It's there's. I mean, there's words, but the art is just, uh, it's just breathtaking. And the panels and everything. I think what you mean is it's worth it only for the art. Is that what you're talking about? No, no, I love the story. Yeah. I like the story. Real quick, the... just give me a quick plot description. Oh, yeah, fuck yourself. Go, go. Yeah. Well, first of all, there's a sunrise, and it's in the fall. <laughs> It's very uh, hard to hold on to the story here. It's like trying to have a conversation with somebody who's tripping on mushrooms and you're like, I don't know what you're talking about, man. I can't see what you see. But luckily we can see what Trad Morris sees here because it's absolutely beautiful. Yeah. I, also, I just want to say like they do such a great job of like they give you these little uh, kind of panels quick and then like these giant splash pages. So it's not just how beautiful the art is. They really thought about the layouts and the storytelling. It's it's a whole nother level. Here's what I'm very curious to get your beat on, Pete. GCPD, The Blue Wall, number five from DC Comics, written by John Rilly, art by Stefano Raphael. So we have to give you a plot rundown here. We've been following these three rookies in the Gotham Police Department. We've been dealing with different issues in different ways. One of them, a one of Hispanic descent, has been dealing with some serious racial prejudice coming from the Gotham Police Department. And last issue, he cracked and killed Renee Montoya's brother and partner, I believe, 
at the same time. This issue, please don't focus on this, but I think this is what it is. He goes like basically full on Punisher killing members of the police department and other characters in what he calls a mission of vengeance to really point out oh, the failings of the police job. department. This is not working for me at this point, to be honest with you. And it's a real bummer because I understand what John Ridley is getting at, but it feels like it's twisted to a point where it's commenting on comics instead of the real world where the first two and a half, sorry, three and a half issues really felt very realistic in this Gotham setting. Now we're firmly in Gotham. Now we're firmly in comic book world. And even though I, I love Stefano Raffaele's art, and I think there's some really interesting characterization here, I don't know. I'm waiting for me to get hooked back in, but it's it's too much, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing. We started checking out this comic because, like, here's an interesting idea, right? Exploring this, the realism of the cop's life and what if someone trying to be a rookie and join the force and all this and uh, okay here's a story about horrible racism and just kind of like hazing somebody because they're different and horrible people doing horrible things you know and you're like okay cops are assholes that's what we're kind of that's what it's saying and like the, they're horrible people and so then you're pushing someone to a horrible place where they snap and then they start killing people. And so like, what are we doing now? Like, where are we going? And instead of it's like saying like, okay, what are we trying to say? All of a sudden now it's like Batman's there and like, you like, what the fuck? So I, I, I was interested to see what ideas we were going to explore and what kind of things. And if it was going to try to be this thing of like, here's life of a cop and maybe trying to say something about that or say something about the people who put on badges and are trying to do the right things and maybe are pushed into horrible places. I don't know, but I'm not having fun and I'm also not learning anything or trying to, you know what I mean? It's just all of a sudden now it's just this guy who got ridiculed and picked on and then made some horrible decisions is now doing horrible things. So it's like, what are we doing? Who is this for? Why is this fun? And I don't know. Well, I, 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 I understand what you're saying. I don't know if fun is necessarily the right word because I don't think it was fun at any point necessarily. Right, I, mean, I, I do think your point though, that you're getting at about Whatever the eventual end point is potentially may justify how we got there, but we don't know what that end point is yet. So I was fascinated of about the first couple of issues that I'm willing to check this out until the end and see where it goes. But the issue that I'm having here is I understand in essence the idea of police departments give people weapons, tools, and then push them into a place where they can be radicalized. That's what this book is talking about. But it's skirting the line of having like some Gotham stuff. Like Batman doesn't show up in this book, but Two Face shows up in this book. Two Face, yes. Yeah, who has a relationship with Renee Montoya uh, from back in the day from Gotham Central and other books. But it's also ignoring other things like the fact that Renee Montoya is also the question. Like it's sort of picking and choosing what it does in this DC Comics world. And it's not gelling with what's happening with this character who. What exactly you're saying by you picked, you, the writer, picked the Hispanic character to be the one who got radicalized. That, in my mind, is problematic and uncomfortable, but not in a way where it's, ooh, I'm uncomfortable, I'm really thinking about this, so much as, what what are you going to do with this? Are you going to kill this guy at the end? Are you going to be like, you did all right, buddy, good good idea, when he clearly did not? Where are we heading with this at a place where it doesn't need to give me closure, it doesn't need to make me happy, but where it feels like it's saying something about our world through this Gotham world. Exactly. I, that's the thing. And, and hopefully, that, like you said, we haven't read the whole thing. We're kind of in the middle. But I was hoping it would be a thing of like, look at these racist cops. You know, maybe this one person can try to 
and still change and to try to make something of like have them look at their hatred and what they're doing to somebody who's supposed to be on their team and a part of you know so it was like that's where i was hoping things would go that he would like put a mirror up to him and be like look at how horrible you were being you know what i mean like you're, you're bringing that horror out into the world and you're supposed to be the good guy you know that kind of thing and I, I just don't know what we're doing anymore, and uh, I'm a little lost. Well, listen, we will pay attention and see what happens in the next couple of issues, or at least the next issue. Undiscovered Country, number 23, from Image Comics, written by Scott, <coughs> excuse me, Scott Snyder and Charles Soule, art by Giuseppe Coley. Are Kevin you allergic Coley. to Scott Snyder? Uh, yep, I got an allergy. Don't bring it up or oh, I'll start man. sneezing. Such a great writer. More like Snot Snyder. Am I oh right? come on! Because don't I'm do that sneezing. To him. Because I'm sneezing, that. I'm sneezing, man. I'm sneezing. He doesn't deserve that. Hey, He's I'm sneezing. That. Here. Art by Giuseppe Cavicoli and Leonardo Marcello Grassi. We are. I, it seems like getting to the end of Undiscovered Country here. It says next issue to be concluded, um, but big stuff goes down here in terms of answers about the spiral, Aurora, all these things we've been following all along, and there's some wild action throughout. What do you think, Pete? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I keep being like, how are we going to tie this all up? This is a creative juggernaut through history and time, and the Gettysburg thing was so cool and interesting. I, I think that this is, like, creatively such an amazing accomplishment, and I'm, I really want it to land well so I can be like, this was awesome. Um uh, but right now, it's just a ton of action and cool things kind of tying up. I'm just interested to see how well it's going to, if it'll make sense and make me want to go back and kind of reread, because that's what I'm hoping for. Yeah, that was the big thing that I was going to say that I feel like I said several times throughout this run is this feels like the sort of one that'll be worth going back and reading from the beginning and not month to month or with the breaks in between. So you can kind of track the characters and the arcs a little better. Something is Killing the Children, number 29 from Boom Studios, written by James Tide the Fourth, art by Wertha Dandaria. In this issue, we're getting sort of like back to the classic rhythm of Something is Killing the Children, which I know you and I are more positive on than Justin. But Erica has uh, escaped from a police station where her nemesis has killed absolutely everybody. Meanwhile, back at the House of Slaughter, a bunch of political finagling is going on. Even with the scarcity of the story, I'm still very into what's going on here. And Werther Del Daria's art is phenomenal, particularly there's a section set in a limo where the Grand Dragon of the House of Slaughter is just eating some gummy candies. Oh my god, the gummy worms eating scene was just like, how can you make gummy worms creepy? Oh, mm -hmm. they do it. Like, they do yeah. it. They make it happen. Having a dragon eat gummy worms, creepiest thing you've ever seen. Yeah, no, that's not much. true, but it's impressive what they pull off. But yeah, this continues to be such an amazing comic. So badass. Really such an amazing world and something we've never really seen before. It's very impressive to get some original ideas happening in a world of uh, retread. So... This has just been something that I have been really enjoying from start to finish. So well done. I, I, I eat every single issue up and say thank you, more please. And uh, it continues to be such a uh, highlight in my poll. Punisher War Journal Base. Number one from Marvel, written by Torin Grodback, art by Dishimbro Morissette Fan. This is tying into the main Punisher title and fleshing out a small scene that we got there from Jason Aaron's run, showing Punisher when he's back home with his family, going on Halloween and doing Halloween stuff. And of course, some Punisher stuff happens instead. I really like these one shots. I think they're nice, interesting Punisher tales. The art is very good. How do you feel, Pete? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a cool exploration of, you know, this idea of PTSD and kind of like therapy and family dynamics and the reality of somebody who goes to war and has to become somebody else. And then how do you turn that off? How do you kind of go back to a normal setting after you've been turned into a killing machine? Uh, it's an interesting way to explore it. And it's 
and you see him struggling um, in therapy and in life to kind of, uh, you know, be present. And um, yeah, so it's uh, it's interesting. I also really love the art style. Um, a very cool kind of uh, uh, well done, especially the facial expressions and different kind of panels. So yeah, there's also some action moments, but the real kind of uh, is the smaller stuff, you know, with uh, Frank and the family. Well, and I love the idea of taking a small scene from the main Punisher title that happened a couple of months back at this point and then fleshing that out and showing how he got there. It's the best si type of prequel type thing where it's not like, it's not a question that I had, but it answers that question anyway in a really satisfying way. Deceased, War of the Undead Gods, number six from DC Comics, written by Tom Taylor, art by Trevor Harrison. In this issue, we're getting some drag-out fights between Mr. Ms. Plizik and the Spectre. Yeah. And I think we probably have to spoil the end of this issue because I'm sure this is what you want to talk about. So spoilers here. In this issue, Alfred deals with yet another loss in his life. Leslie Tompkins is killed by the end dead and becomes the Spectre by the end of the issue and beats the shit out of some undead folks. What'd you think, Pete? I mean, you know, spoilers, but the Spectre punching through a dude's head? Uh, pretty awesome. I mean, come on. That was amazing. Kind of... That was a pretty cool moment. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is a lot of crazy action, a lot of death and destruction, uh, uh, a lot of good guys losing here. So cool art, got a unique style that kind of fit, fits this uh, zombie craziness. Cool choice. Uh, I think this is well done. Yeah. Inferno Girl Red, number two from Image Comics, written by Matt Groom, art by Erica Durso. We mentioned this earlier, but there is a little bit of a crossover with Radiant Pink that doesn't necessarily tie into this issue. But if you hadn't paid attention to the first issue, there is a whole futuristic university that was stolen by an evil being. And one of the students becomes the new Inferno Girl Red, which is basically like a Power Ranger. Uh, and she is fighting oh, some yeah. evil monsters here. I got here. confused. A you got bit confused. When I said yes. Power Ranger. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no problem. They all look like Power Rangers. It's okay. Well, no, but I mean, you know, I. This is much a lot more of Power comics Rangers. and I yes. confused Inferno Go Red with Radiant Pink, so I apologize. All good. You remembered how many line, you so. remembered how many eyes the cat had, so that was the important <laughs> thing. This is great. These are oversized issues. It's a great sort of YA book, I would say, set in the massive verse. I'm having a lot of fun reading this. It's very creative and there's a terrifying cliffhanger at the end. Yeah, I also really love the relationship stuff in this. Uh, love the action, and uh, yeah, I was really impressed with the color choice and and all the kind of Power Rangers action you kind of got in this. is a very vibrant and cool looking. There you go. Youth, season three, number two from Comicsology by Kurt Byers. In this issue, our youths are fighting a dude on Mars who explodes and discovering some potential information about their superheroic origins. There's not a ton of story here, but what there is, I thought was really beautiful to read. I'm very into this story. It's very different from the previous volumes of Youth, but I like it quite a bit. Yeah, crazy cool art style, love the action, and very little words, so I was enjoying that. Great, and we've hit uh, the last couple of reviews on the podcast, so Pete has to speed things up and just yeah, be like, good, bad, good, bad, good, bad. Yeah. She-Hulk number 10 for Marvel, written by Rainbow Rowell, art by Takashi Miyazawa. This is picking up on what happened last issue with Jack of Hearts, getting his radioactive powers back and being no longer able to touch She-Hulk. This issue just kind of follows her through the repercussions of that. The guy she was falling in love with, or at least dating, is now gone. What do you do with a breakup like that? As usual, Rainbow Rowell crushes the relationship stuff. I loved reading this issue. I love this book. Uh, yes. Oh, Jack of Hearts and She-Hulk. I love this. I didn't know I would love that. What a ship. Uh, yeah. This is just, this art is just absolutely stylish type bananas. Just really kind of fun. I I love the heart in this uh, and She-Hulk. I think She-Hulk is such a great character when used like this to tell interesting stories. She's such a badass, but also just kind of having some slower stuff with her. 
uh, becomes so much more powerful as well. Um, you can do so much cool things with She-Hulk as a character, and I think this is so well showcased here in this issue. Uh, this is a, a fantastic run. You should be checking out She-Hulk right now if you are not. And I'll just mention, if you enjoy this book, I just read Rainbow Rowell released a short story collection a couple of months back called Scattered Showers, which is great. Oh, so yeah. she has a bunch of novels that I love. But if you're looking to just like get into some shorter stories of hers, check that out. I had a lot of fun with that as well. Cool. Immortal Sergeant number two from Image Comics Where written by Joe Kelly. Where do you have the Kelly. time to read other books, man? I don't know. I don't know. Just never sleep. That's the main trick. <laughs> Immortal Sergeant number two from Image Comics written by Joe Kelly, art by Ken Nimura. In this issue, we finally get the concept of the book, which is this hard-ass sergeant who is on the brink of retirement. His no-account son comes to stay with him with his family. We get that interaction there. Pete, I know I talked about this the last time, but this is one of your favorite teams from I Kill Giants. How would you feel about this issue? Yeah, just unbelievable. I mean, this is like... Such an interesting idea and very well kind of uh, put out there in a kind of interesting, creative way. i am been really, I love the setup and kind of like the pace of it. Uh, an amazing award-winning team. So I'm just uh, eating all of this up and uh, saying yes, please more. The Ones, number four from Dark Horse Comics, written by Brian Michael Bendis, art by Jacob Edgar. This is the end of this series, which has found a bunch of Chosen Ones coming up against Satan, who has returned to Earth. Here we get the conclusion of that conflict, and it goes in a way that I, don't, I certainly didn't expect. Um, I'll tell you what, I like this series a lot. Jacob Edgar's art is very fun. Brian Michael Bendis is very loose and shaggy on this and the writing in a good way. Like he's just clearly having a good time. I don't know plot wise, if I was totally satisfied <laughs> with how it wrapped up in this issue, because it just sort of feels like they were like, yeah, yeah, let's just end it. It's fine. And they just kind of go in that direction, but I had a good time with the series regardless. How did you feel about how it wrapped up Pete? I, yeah, I think this is very creative and cool. Love the art style uh fun amazing demons and monsters and a fun way to kill a giant demon you know i had a blast uh blast with this so i enjoyed it we got to talk about something though pete we have to talk about something that happens to this issue after spoilers they kill satan they're all hanging out and having pizza and this character who brings out the contracts warns the person who killed satan is like hey you got to be careful though because satan's going to make it really personal and come after you and starts talking about how what the devil really likes to do is steal yeah. people's marriages and wipe them out of reality. Why is this a thing? What did you they... think about that joke, Pete? How did you feel about that joke? I didn't joke? like it. I didn't like it at all. <laughs> oh, you didn't like it so much that you're like 20 feet away from the microphone right now. Yeah, I, I didn't like it. I was hoping we wouldn't have to uh, bring this up. You know, I was hoping, I was, I thought we were moving on. You know what I mean? No, no, and, man. Uh, we got to stay in this moment. Oh, great. Forever. Yeah, yeah. We you know just need one more is, day. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. You know what's fun is uh, when people keep, you know what I mean? You have a wound and you're trying to heal and you're trying to walk away and people just keep picking at it. You know what I mean? They keep fucking picking at it. You know? But did you, you had to at least like a little bit that Brian Michael nope. Bendis was joking about it. That nope. he was like, this is dumb. Why would the devil do that? Why would he care about that? That's what you talk about all the time. Yeah, it is dumb, <laughs> but we can't just, I, I just don't, I, you don't want to think about it. I don't want to ever think you about it ever time. again. And I would like to live. A well, life. a good way of not thinking about it is focus on a different relationship like Black Cat and Spider-Man. Just <laughs> sort of saying, <laughs> throwing it out there. <laughs> Superman Space Age number three from DC Comics written by Mark Russell, art by Living Mike Spike. <laughs> Mike Spike. All right. All red. This is continuing this alternate timeline. Uh, and what I love about this. Wait, wait, I'm sorry. I stepped on the whole intro and, and amazing artists and people behind this. Do you mind doing that? Again? Mark Russell, know. Mike Spike, all red, Superman, Space Age, number three. 
This is a third oversized issue showing what turns out to be one of the alternate Earths that was destroyed by the Anti-Monitor back on Crisis on Infinite Earths. So it's following this alternate direction of the DC Universe with different versions of the characters you know. Here we get more of that, particularly a lot of focus on Batman in particular, as well as yeah. Superman. But it really pays off in a beautiful way. This was a phenomenal story that actually tied into main continuity in a way that I wasn't expecting. Um, just great stuff. Just a great, great three issue series. I was very impressed. Yeah, I mean, All Red's art is really just phenomenal. And it's worth picking it up just to see All Red's takes on these different characters. I loved All Red's Swamp Thing in this. The Batman was fun. I also love Batman's line of, like, oh, you'll tell me. You know, like, mm -hmm. I'm going to get it out of you. Just such a really cool. Uh, I, yeah, I, I think that it's it's hard to stop talking about the art because it's just um, it's so impressive and such a fun, different take on uh, the characters that we've known for so long. Uh, but yeah, cool uh, writing and idea. I love the exploration of the, the different characters. Um, I, I think this is really well done. And I'll also throw out there, Mark Russell writes a phenomenal Lex Luthor, both in oh, this yeah. and yeah. there was the, I'm forgetting the exact name of the title, but it was the Future State book, which was like Superman versus Lex Luthor or something. Mm -hmm. Just the way that, and Mark Russell does this all the time, but the way that he drills it on Lex's focus on money and just really gets to that, he's so smart about that stuff in such a funny way. Great. Let's move to one that I know is one of your issues of the week, if not your issue of the week. Ice Cream Man number 34 from Image Comics, written by W. Maxwell Prince, art by Martin Barrasso. In this issue, we're following a bunch of hobos on a train together trying to contemplate the meaning of life going to town to town. That's some big Ice Cream Man twists. Pete, why did you like this one so much? I mean, this is just... What's interesting about this is it's not as scary but still, there is such a haunting way about these characters and the way they're telling, like, what's the craziest story you've ever heard? And you're like, oh, God, oh, no, one of these stories is going to happen, I know. It. And it's just like they do such a great job of setting up and delivering. Sometimes you have no idea how these are going to go, but this kind of, like, laid it out in such a way where you're like, oh, man. Uh, but, yeah, just so cool. Uh, it wasn't as horrific as it was kind of like a classic campfire story. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Um, so, yeah, I was just super impressed with this. And, um, yeah, I mean, hobos on a train. You know what I mean? What What's to what's not to love? Exactly. I do want to point out, and I mentioned this a couple of times, the last issues of Ice Cream Man. It's been really fascinating to me to see this title's journey go from, like you're talking about, horrific and nihilistic to... Uh, it's beyond the past couple of issues, but yeah, like there's a bit of optimism there. Like the last couple of issues, I'm thinking about the one set in the rehab center as well, where horrible things happen, but it's all about, we need to push through anyway. Life is terrible. Life is an absolute horror show. But if you could focus on that one ray of sunshine at the end, oh, dude. even if you can't reach it, maybe Don't, you can make that, it through in some way. That whole sunshine thing was beautiful. Awesome. Absolutely beautiful. So another so beautiful, wonderful issue here. But Hellboy, also the, yeah. the fact that it, it like referenced itself in a way that didn't feel like, all right, you know, like we get mm -hmm. it. We know, you know what I mean? Like it made reference to uh, uh, the two kind of like main like antagonist protagonist in in a way that I think really worked. It's rare when you can like write a comic about characters and then have the different characters mention the plot of the comic in a way that doesn't feel, you know, just self-serving or not well done. I thought it was, it worked so well there and was such a kind of throwaway, but such a reward for people who've been reading it since the beginning. I was just super impressed. I mean, the writing and the art meet in such a magical place continually in all of these issues in such a cool, creative way that is, is something that I think is going to be held up and talked about for years because what Ice Cream Man is doing is something that I think it's just it's legendary it's absolutely legendary 
Totally agree. Hellboy in Love at number three from Dark Horse Comics, written by Christopher Golden, art by Matt Smith. This is jumping forward a couple of weeks, I believe, for the last two issues. We're following this flirtation between Hellboy and his new lady archaeologist, who he's kind of crushing on, and they're kind of crushing on each other. This is a very romantic book, Pete. Yeah, I know. And it's it's strange because, like, I'm not sure how much I'm shipping them, but I'm still loving the story. You know what I mean? Like, it's doing such a good job of giving me great Hellboy story adventures that I'm not, like, mad that I'm not like, exactly shipping these two. Although, I love both of the characters. I also... Uh, I'm a sucker for a Yankee scap. So, like, there's a lot of things that are working for me here. I just don't know if I, you know, uh, really Well, want I think them we kind them. of know they're not going to work out in the long term because this takes place earlier in the history. So that's probably looming over it a little bit. But I agree. This is just a classic Hellboy story um, that I'm really enjoying. And I really do like the romance. I think they're nailing that part. You got to get that from the title. And they got it in spades. Is Last... it weird that, like, you know, it's like a little bit of the Betty kind of bun thing for me when she has the hair up and the hat? Oh, know. okay. You you don't like it because you think you should be with her, is what you're saying. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. not what I'm saying. I, I am my own hell boy, though. I think that's, uh, that's very true. Nice. Immoral X-Men, number one for Marvel, <laughs> written by Kira Gillett, art by Paco Medina. This is continuing the Sins of Sinister storyline. Oh, and here, here we we're go. focusing on Emma Frost yeah, and some of the Quiet go. Council as they fight against and try to recruit Sinister. This book is wild. Every issue of this is wild. I want to say this is not specifically applicable to this, but I've been going every week with my son to the comic book shop now. He's eight years old, and he's been very interested in Sins of Sinister in particular, and I'm like, it's confusing. You're not going to like it. He's like, just tell me about it. And then I'm like, okay, let me describe the plot for you. All right, first I need to explain what happens at the beginning of Jonathan Hickman's run on x <laughs> Wait, let me explain who Moira McTaggart is. Wait, let me explain who Mr. Sin. And there's so much going on here that at the very least, like, just on the level of what's going on with Emma Frost in this book, that was the thing I was like, I'm going to hook onto that. This is fun. It is fun to watch her go absolutely hog wild in the X-Men universe in this weird alternate timeline. That's what I enjoyed about it. Pete, I know there's probably so many things you didn't enjoy about this, but was there anything you liked about this book? Uh, hmm, let me just go back to my notes here real quick. The, the end. I like the end. Uh, I liked when it was over. Uh, uh, <laughs> the art. Uh, the art's incredible. Um, Great. Great really stuff. just really killed it. Super impressive. I mean, I don't know what you want me to say, man. We've got Nothing. a sinister... I, I really don't. <laughs> You don't want me to say anything? No, just because I know we're going to get into a fight about Krakoa and what what a way to end the podcast. We don't need to do that. Yeah, exactly. So so we have a sinister Emma Frost, not a real Emma Frost, but a sinister version of Emma Frost. So even though it's sinister, she's still fighting against sinister. And then she reveals that she's torturing somebody every night when she sleeps. There's some dude just chained up watching her sleep every night yeah cool mastermind yeah no i think i think this is i mean if you're going to chain somebody up and make you watch you sleep mastermind would be like thank you <laughs> yeah that's <laughs> I, I love it <laughs> it's like uh, there's a, it's a lot to unpack in this issue um and we're going to do it over the next couple of weeks we're going to be talking about this issue every week coming up great but, yeah, if you'd like to support that, patreon.com slash comic book club. Also, we do a live show every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. to Crowdcast, YouTube, and Facebook. Come check it out. And hang out to chat about comic books. Don't forget to subscribe on Apple, Android, Spotify, Stitcher, or the app of your choice at Comic Book Live on Twitter. Comic Book Club Live on Instagram and TikTok. ComicBookClubLive.com for this podcast and many more. Until next time, we'll see you at the comic book shop. Hey, thanks for listening. Hey. Hey. Oh,